Well, the war broke out on a Sunday. You remember that the radio was called the wireless then, it wasn't the radio, it was the wireless. And the wireless was on and they were sort of um, going on about uh, the situation. And we heard Chamberlain say that um, I think they hadn't had a reply to their ultimatum and therefore war was declared at about 11 or 12 o'clock on the morning. And when we came through where, all the people were out there crying their eyes out. And, uh, and the, the sirens all went. So I went rushing over to the Abbey Gardens because there's an air raid shelter built into the sides of the watercress beds as they were then. And it had been used in the First World War by my family. The older ones were frightened because some of that war experience from the 1418 war. Us young ones, we wasn't. For us, it was quite exciting. In 1914 18, when the war broke out, the young, they surged into the streets and the young men stood and cheered and, and the, but they didn't, not this time, it was quite a, quite a different thing altogether. Now when rationing came along, that did all sorts of things. It brought powdered milk, which was a good thing, and, and it also brought powdered egg. Now to me, one of the best foods of the war was powdered egg. Lots of people will complain about the rationing, but in my opinion, the rationing also did some good. The more wealthy families, of course, it was different because they had to make it commonise with everything, or their sugar or their sweet ration, they had to commonise, whereas before they could buy what they liked. So for the poorer people in the rationing period, I think, was a good thing. If you like to know something very, very tasty, if you can even think about it, is a thing uh, here. Carrot and liver balls. It's um, a very peculiar recipe indeed. There is carrot and oat biscuits, carrot croquette, croquettes, carrot salad, carrot jam, <laughs> carrot and potato pie. Carrots came into lots of things. Yes, carrots came into the Christmas puddings. There was no lack of food in, in, in the forces, no, no. Um, mind you, it was um, good, wholesome food. The actual finish of rationing was about 1952, I think, when they suddenly took everything off rationing. For us young ones, it was good because um, you could go to the sweet shop, you know, and instead of having to give coupons to get sweets or whatever, you could have what chocolate you, you liked. We knew the war was going to start, really, and uh, it started on the Sunday, but we actually went on the Saturday. And so we all went off in this coach, and when we got there, we arrived at the school in Helsties, where we were given uh, drinks and sandwiches, had a medical, even looked in our hair to see if we'd got any creepy crawly things. Then we were taken a few at a time Around the streets, we got there to this house. As I say, this lady wanted one girl. And I said, well, and she said, I'll have you. And she, I said, well, I can't go without my little brother. We've got to stay together. So she looked at him and she said, all right, well, I'll take him as well, which was nice. So we did. First of all, when we went there, we only used to go to school in the afternoons because the Helsted children used to go in the mornings. And uh, suddenly there was this influx of other children, plus... There were some children also there from London. I wasn't there that long. I was only there for about six months because I left school, because you used to have to leave school at 14. I saw my first bomb crater at Nazing. I think the first bomb fell at Nazing. So my father took me over to to look at it. It had fallen in the field, so it hadn't done any damage. A big bomb dropped in Roundton Road, just off Honey Lane, and uh, it took out five houses there and people were hurt, and the wreck at the back of the uh, Larson's wreck. Well, I wasn't scared, strangely enough. We had an air raid shelter, and my mother used to make me go down there every night. It was one of the Anderson shelters built into the ground, and um, my father built a big porch on the outside with sandbags. We had bunks inside 
and we had radio and we I think we had some form of lighting and they didn't only drop bombs they dropped things that we used to call screamers now screamers are cardboard tubes weighted at one end with slots in and what they do is they throw them out of the airplane and as they come down they come down fast because of the weight that the air goes through the slots and it creates a screaming noise which is extremely frightening i got more nervous when the uh, V1s, the doodlebugs started coming over because they would stop and you wouldn't know where they were going to go. And I was in the cinema when the first doodlebug came over and we all had to try and get under our seats. Now you, you obviously know about Ibridge Street, the, the V2 that dropped in Ibridge Street. I was there minutes after it happened. You know, three children died there. I was stationed then just outside, or just near Cannes in France and one of my jobs as a batman was to get the daily papers. They always came a day late. I sort of flicked in the middle pages and there right way across the middle paper there was a huge great bomb hole and then I looked to read it and I saw it was Waltham Abbey. There was an awful lot of bombs dropped here all because they were trying to get the powder mills because obviously in the powder mills it was a vital war effort going on in there. I heard the bang and I knew, looked straight towards Waltham Abbey and I could see this huge great black cloud of where the explosions happened and I knew then it was a gunpowder mills. In January 1940 there was a terrible explosion in the um, nitroglycerine plant and uh, there was um, five people killed. And then again in the April, it went again, and the other five people were killed. And they're buried up in uh, the cemetery there in Suiston Road. There were numerous smaller uh, incidents getting burnt with acid uh, if, um, in the acid plant, if acid spilled out onto anybody, all around the place were old tin baths full of water and you just had to make a dive for one of these and jump in it. Well I went as an ordinary labourer to start with and uh, eventually I became in charge of the box house which um, made sure that all the um, boxes were clean and ready for uh, explosives to be packed in and then sent on their way down to Woolwich and Plumstead for the filling factories. I was sent along to the gunpowder mills uh, where they were asking for people to uh, uh, work in the main lab. And that's really how I started, that had been about 1930, late 1939. It was really testing uh, the um, explosives and the propellants uh, and also the various materials that were used to make them. Acids, acetone, cotton waste, glycerine, and uh, materials such as that, test them for purity. Well, it was the, the, the um, government and all that, you know, I mean, they, they sent to us and, uh, and said you had a choice of um, the ATS or whatever, and we chose the land army, see. We, we started the next week and um, it was just picking tomatoes then because that was uh, July and and then of course you go through the course then like, like keep picking and picking and sending to market you know. A lot of men worked in nurseries well they were called up for the war so of course this is when the land army took over and there was a load there was loads of us some of them come from London and um, uh, we all we all got on very well. The lads that I was friendly with were all much older than me and one day they said that they were going to join the Waltham Abbey Fire Service. So I thought that sounded like a good idea so I came with them and it was a bit of a joke because they said you know that no way will you get in the fire service because you're too young. I was 13 years old.
And before I knew where it was, I'm accepted in the fire service at 13. And I was actually wearing a fire service uniform at 13. And we used to do fire service duty at the top of the Waltham Abbey Church because you could see right across London from the top of Waltham Abbey Church. So you could pinpoint where fires were and where it was all happening. And of course then we used uh, vehicles which were about a tonne and a half vehicle. And it was like a big van, always painted grey, and that half of the back was cut away. And the ladder used to go across the top and the fellas would sit in the back. We're still then just outside Khan, and about midnight we come down to a big square and on the side there was a church which had been badly damaged. In the middle of the road they got a big bonfire going and there was all these parishioners from the village around there and they was having a little service. That's always stuck in my mind that all these old people were kneeling on the cobbled roads, you know, to give thanks that the war was over. I went away to the Far East and left my wife at home there for four years with two babies in the pram when I went. And when I came home, of course they were young lads, and the youngest one came up and put his arms around my legs and looked up at me, and then run back to his mum and he said, is that my dad, mum? Brother-in-law had been a prisoner of war in Germany, and then when we found he'd been released, we all put banners up and said sort of welcome home and that sort of thing and that, that, that was exciting. It was just a great feeling of thankfulness and I hate to think that we would ever have to go all through that again, I'll be honest.